Okay, so for the first part here of homework 3-2, again, hopefully get through maybe the first half or so. So question one, we've got a box with a mass M pulled with a constant acceleration, A, along the horizontal frictionless floor. The force, the tension here is making an angle of 15 degrees, so I'm pulling upward on that rope at a tension of T. If T is the tension of the wire, then which of the following is true? Well, if the box is moving with an acceleration along the floor of A, and I know that the mass of the box is M, then I know the net force along the floor would simply be mass times acceleration, right? Be M times A. In this case, because tension is the only thing providing that net force, and specifically because it's the horizontal component of tension that's providing that net force, then I know that the, the total tension, the hypotenuse here, has to be greater than right that, that horizontal component. So that tells me that option B is my correct choice. Since tension is the only thing providing that force, and since this is only a component of the tension, the total tension has to be more than the mass times the acceleration of the block itself. Um, so hopefully this one wasn't too bad, but if you needed to set it up, there it is for you. Question two here is one of the trickiest questions that I know we've seen some examples like this going back to AP Physics 1. Um, so hopefully this looks familiar, but it is still is a very, very tricky one. Um, and actually, in order to figure this out, so that what is the scale going to read as it has two blocks of weight W, well, I really just want to look at either half of this diagram. So if I'm looking over here at this half, right, I know that if there's no motion, right, if the objects are just hanging here, then everything is in equilibrium. And because of that, the force of gravity pulling down is W, which means this tension pulling upward, this tension pulling upward would need to be equal to W as well. Well, since there's no appreciable fr friction here in the pulley, then that tension is the same throughout the pulley. And so the tension in this side of the rope would also be W. So right there, the fact that I've got this being W, that tells me that the spring scale would be stretched to read W as well. So my actual answer here is actually just A. It's just one W. Now I know some of us are thinking, well, we've got this also pulling this way at W as well, right? But think about what the spring scale does. As the spring stretches, right, as the spring stretches a certain length, it now pulls back with a strength of W as well. So if I'm looking here, so if I'm looking at the hook here, right, the tension we know is pulling off with a tension of W. And then again, the spring would be pulling off with that same strength of W in the opposite direction. Well, as the spring pulls W this way, it also by nature will pull W in that way again. Because as a spring stretches, right, as it stretches enough to provide this much force, it's really pulling in from both sides with that much force. So by me attaching another mass over here, another weight over here, I'm actually not changing anything on the spring scale. That spring scale would naturally be pulling uh, with a tension of W this way anyway. So anyway, the answer for this one is just a single W. Again, a lot of us probably, our gut instinct would say 2W on this. Um, but watch out for that. Question three here, don't be thrown off by it. Right, so a box is sliding down a frictionless plane that's inclined at some angle above the horizontal. As the box slides down, what is the gravitational force doing? The gravitational force, as always, pulls straight down vertically. Right, so option D is my correct option, no matter what the box is doing. So don't fall into the trap that, yes, a component, right, we know the sine component of gravity would be going down the ramp, but gravity itself is pulling vertically. Okay, so don't overthink this one too much. Gravity always just pulls straight down. So question four here, they tell me it's a rough inclined plane, which tells me that the frictional force is not going to be zero, so I can rule that one out. So then the other questions here, the other options all relate to the weight of the block, right? So how does the frictional force compare to the weight of the block? Is it equal, greater than, or less than the weight? Well, I know the weight, the force due to gravity, pulls straight down. I know the normal force would be perpendicular, again, being normal to the surface. So it's perpendicular to the surface. And that alone tells me that the normal force is going to be less than the force of gravity because the normal force is going to be equal and opposite to just the cosine component of gravity. right? So that right there tells me that the normal force is already less than the force of gravity. So then when I consider friction, which is taking some coefficient, and some coefficient that is usually less than 1, right? So I'm taking some, some number less than 1, whatever it may be, 
and then I'm multiplying that by the normal force which is already less than the weight and it's definitely going to be less than the weight of the brick. Right, so we just need to be comfortable with the fact that it's not equal to and it's not greater than the weight of the brick. Okay, so question five here asks us to rank in order from largest to smallest the magnitude of the net force acting on each of these. It does say they've all been thrown upward and they all have about the same size and we're not worried about air resistance. I do also want to see some explanation in your answer, so please don't just rank these. Also offer some explanation. As I go through this video, I will describe it. I won't write it all out, but feel free to jot down any notes to help you explain it. Uh, but anyway, so ranking this in order of the smallest, right, the, excuse me, the largest to smallest net force. Well, if these are all thrown straight up into the air, right, the second they're in the air, the only force acting on them is the force of gravity. Right? So the force of gravity is pulling down on each of these. I just need to decide which one's the strongest and which one's the weakest. Well, we know the acceleration of gravity, right? So the acceleration would be the same for each of these at 9.8. So in order to determine which one has the strongest force, I just simply have to consider the fact that the force of gravity depends on the mass times the acceleration of gravity. So again, they all have the same acceleration. So if I want to figure out which one has the highest force, I just need to know which one has the highest mass. And obviously I can convert these to kilograms if I want to, but I don't really need to. Right, if I just look at this, the one with the highest mass here is the 400 gram ball over on the right. So the force acting on D is going to be the highest. And then if I look through, B and C both have the same mass, and therefore they would have the same force due to gravity. So FB and FC are equal and they're both less than FD. And then finally, the weakest force here would be the force of gravity acting on A because A has the smallest mass. Okay, so again, I've ranked my forces. I do expect you obviously to have the ranking of the forces, but you also need to make sure you're explaining. Okay, so again, an explanation, we know that they all have the same acceleration due to gravity, and therefore the highest force is gonna be the one with the highest mass. Since they all have the same acceleration, the higher the mass, the higher the force. Right. So anyway, uh, explain that in your own words as best as you can, but do make sure we're working on that part as well. So question six here, good old tension problem, right? I know sometimes these can get pretty complicated. This one's actually not too bad, though, because they tell me that the two cables are the same length, and the two cables here make an equal angle right, with the vertical. So these two angles here make the same theta. And the reason it's helpful to know, since I've got my, my distances and I've got my knowing my angles are the same, right? then it's very helpful to know that because that tells me that each of these tensions is going to have to uh, divide this equally as it supports it. right? So this really becomes just an equilibrium problem. Since I know that the loudspeaker isn't going anywhere, I know the net force is zero, and therefore the sum of the horizontal forces would have to be zero, and the sum of the vertical forces would have to be zero. Right. So again, this tension, I am saying that this is for sure the same tension since they're the same length of rope and they're both at equal angles. I can also go ahead and find that angle, which I'll do. Right. If I just focus on the measurements that they gave me here, I know the hypotenuse is three. I know it's two meters from the vertical. I know it's a right triangle up here. So I can find theta by just using, in this case, I'll use cosine of theta. Right. So theta equals cosine inverse of negative, excuse me, of 2 over 3, right? And then when I find that angle, I get about 48.2 degrees. So I found my angle with respect to the vertical here. And then the key is, right, they give me the force. So again, if I'm focusing on the loudspeaker, they tell me the, the weight of it, which allows me to find the force due to gravity. I know the force due to gravity equals, I should have said the mass, right? Force due to gravity equals the mass times the acceleration of gravity. So 20 times 9.8, which ends up being 196 newtons. So that's how strong the loudspeaker is being pulled down, 196 newtons. Well, we know because the loudspeaker isn't going anywhere, there has to be a net force of 196 newtons also going upward to balance that out. So in order for that to happen, since we have two cables, and those two cables are pulling at equal angles, we know that each of these cables is going to have to individually support exactly half of that 196. So you could either say those two components together add up to be 196, or you could say either one of them individually 
is one or is half of 196. Um, so again, the idea here, I don't know the tension, but I do know the angle is 48.2. So if I was setting up a vertical relationship for this, I would say that T times the cosine component of 48.2, so T times cosine of 48.2, plus another T times cosine of 48.2, since I have two tensions, would collectively have to equal 196, right? Again, the other alternative is, and you can see that if you just add this equation, right? If you add this up, you get 2t cosine of 48.2 equals 196. And so if you just look at really half of the equation, you get t cosine of 48.2 equals half of the 96, or 196, which would be 98. So then solving the rest of the way out here, I would just divide both sides by cosine of 48.2, right? So then 98 divided by 48, or cosine of 48.2, excuse me, would be about 147 newtons, which would then be the tension in either cable. It would be the tension in each cable, right? Anyway, hopefully this one wasn't too bad. Again, if you do have questions on this type of thing, don't hesitate to come find me. But this is the same type of thing we've seen going back to last year. Um, and we do want to make sure we're still comfortable with these type of problems. I've forgotten to do this a few times, so I'll start again writing the correct answer up here. That way you can jump ahead if you need to, or if you want to. Right, but I'll work out question seven. So, a 60 kilogram person rides in an elevator while standing on a scale. The elevator is traveling downward, but slowing down at a rate of 2.00 meters per second squared. So that's significant because if the elevator is traveling downward, but slowing down, that actually tells me the acceleration is going upward, right? We know that objects slow down when the velocity and the acceleration are opposite in direction. So that actually tells me the acceleration is directed upward. That 2.00 meters per second squared is going up. And so intuitively what this should tell us now is the mass, the weight of the scale that it reads should be more than the weight of the person. So if you were to calculate the weight of the person, you should know for sure that this answer should be more than that. Uh, but anyway, if we need to see this worked out, I'll still obviously set it up. Right, so the key here is the fact that if the acceleration is upward, then that tells me the net force has to be going upward, right? Because the net force and the net acceleration, the actual acceleration, always have to be in the same direction. So if the net force is going upward, I just need to think about what are the only two forces that contribute to the net force, because the net force doesn't exist on its own. Well, the only thing contributing to the net force, I'd have the force of the scale pushing upward, which in other words would be my normal force pushing upward, and I'd have the force of gravity of the person pushing downward. So again, if these two are making up my net force, the force of the scale has to be greater than the force of gravity because my net force ends up going upward. So that's where I'm setting this relationship up from. So then solving the rest way out, well, my net force is mass times acceleration. The force of the scale is what I'm looking for. And then my force of gravity is simply mass times gravity. So they give me the mass of 60. They give me the acceleration upward of 2. Again, I'm looking for the scale force. And then I know my mass is 60. And I know my acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. So solving for my scale force, just adding the 60 times 9.8 over to the 60 times 2. And that's where I get my 708 newtons. So this, the force of the scale, this, the scale reading there, ends up being 708 newtons upward. Okay, so question 8 here. Uh, they give us this, and they actually kind of even hint at it, right? They give me the x and the y axis, but they're off at an, at an angle here. So the first thing I did was just reposition to where this is my x and this is my y axis. right? It just makes it a little bit easier to work with. So then reorienting these, these forces here, I've got those three that are all either up or, or horizontal. This one here, then I can break into the components, right? The nice thing about that is when I break this into components, the vertical component ends up being about 2.82, which tells me those two vertical components cancel out. Then the horizontal component ends up being about 1. It's 1.03, right? So then my net force is just the difference then between the 5 and the two ones going off to the left. So 5 minus the 1 minus 1.03 which obviously is about 3, so 2.97 or about 3. Now that I have my net force, it's just force equals mass times acceleration. So 2.97 equals the mass, which they gave me, of 2 kilograms times the acceleration. So then finding my acceleration is 
meters per second squared along the positive x-axis.